Well, we have a couple different rounds of cold air that are going to come in over the next couple of days. The first one we're already starting to feel in parts of the northern plains, the Midwest. That's going to spread out toward the Great Lakes, parts of the northeast, eventually just generally the east. So you look at our high temperatures that we're forecasting on Thursday. Look at this, only 39 in St. Louis, a very chilly day, way below average. Amarillo only topping out in the mid-30s. And uh, similar temperatures around the Texas Panhandle, parts of Oklahoma, highs in the 40s. That's Thursday. Then Friday, you see how it gets a little bit more expansive, the cold that is. Only 54 for a high in Atlanta. And some of these morning lows that we're going to wake up to this weekend. Ouch, 25 in Roanoke. Uh, Mid-30s, both days in Atlanta. Be prepared for that. And there's actually another blast of even colder air that is coming in that's going to affect actually a lot of the country, especially the eastern tier, uh, through a good chunk of next week. Okay, so here is the current temperatures here on the day of departure. Hope to be out of here in the next couple of hours. But I live here where it says 56 degrees. Should be getting up into the uh, high 60s today, a little bit later. But uh, traveling up on Interstate 10, looks like 40s right now. Be a pretty nice day. But um, as I'm coming into uh, eastern Arizona and starting to climb up in the uh, well, that's I 40s really more the elevation. I 10 shouldn't be too much elevation. So. Um, yeah, today's ride should be pretty good until nightfall when it, uh, temperatures start dropping. Um, so current temperatures, you can see, I'm going to head to Oklahoma, avoid the Rockies, and, um, you know, that blue, purple, white band as I work north with my destination of central Minnesota. Um, forecast-wise, as I scroll down, you can see morning lows, um, Kansas City, 23, um, 15 degrees up in Minneapolis, not too, too bad. Um, things are a lot worse the following week, so. And here's timing of the cold blast, as you can see a little animation here. Um, if it comes back there, Sunday and uh, Monday are just crushed. So my plans is to get up there, um, well, hopefully on Sunday, depending on how long we spend in Oklahoma. Um, and then scrolling down to the morning lows the next week, you can see this whole purple area um, where it's single digits um, all the way up through uh, Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota. And then finally, this is kind of interesting, average temperature ranks um, for average 2018, you could see record cold. The dark blue here is record cold all throughout Oklahoma, um, Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa. Um, so, yeah, it's a cold, uh, very cold November. Picked the wrong time to, uh, to shed one of the motorcycles, perhaps, but I think it'll be a fun adventure and um, take you guys with me on that. So more to follow. My first uh, motorcycle kind of content. I thought, uh, so this is my, uh, you see in the background, my 2002 Honda CBR 1100XX Blackbird. Classic uh, motor vehicle. I uh, went ahead and sold it to a gentleman in Minnesota. So here I am in Southern California and I'll be uh, delivering it to him in November. So that'll be a good time. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm gonna walk around, uh, show you guys the, uh, the bike and really, uh, as you can see from the uh, subject, talk about the uh, challenges of cold weather riding especially in a vehicle that doesn't have a whole lot of um, wind protection um, to include feet, legs, uh, face, and body, and everything. So uh, let me switch around and we'll go to the uh, motorcycle now. So once again, this is the um, 2002 Honda CBR 1100XX Blackbird and how I've got it outfitted. 
Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty well set up for sport touring. So I've got a custom uh, Rocky Mayer, Rocky Meyer seat that was made for the previous owner, which was a long distance rider, uh, endurance motorcycling. Uh, it's got this pretty sweet uh, three rack system um, that can handle some uh, Givy, Givy uh, bags, hard bags. The uh... And here we are on the other side of the bike. Um, got a center stand, it's got a pretty nice um, Olin's uh, rear shock with uh, adjustable preload. Forks have been redone. Um, 80, uh, 80, roughly 85,000 miles. Very well taken care of. You can see the bodywork isn't perfect, but a uh, 16 year old motorcycle with 85,000 miles that's uh, participated in several endurance uh, motorcycle rallies. So you've still got uh, HID lights, it's got LED lights within the housing in front. Um, laminar lip to allow you to allows the airflow to kind of shoot up toward my helmet area and if I'm in any, any kind of uh, crouch at all um, the air will go over my helmet which is nice looking under the dash now it's got uh, heated grips that were added this is the HID controller for the uh, auxiliary lights it has a uh, chain oiler button control here um, my normal setup is uh, I got connection for a V1 radar detector that can velcro up in this area. You can see I've got uh, external voltmeter, uh, temperature sensor here, and um, I will be monitoring my uh, GoPro footage and general phone here, and kind of an old school GPS here that I can interchange between various bikes, and uh, we can get into why I use such an old school GPS. There's some features on it that uh, don't exist in the new GPS's. Um, and if your hobby is endurance, motorcycling, and scavenger hunts, well, GPS uh, location becomes a uh, big part of that, so. Okay, looking to the back, uh, this got a custom, part of the custom seat is that instead of the Honda factory single piece seat, I've got it split into two pieces. And if you remove the pillion seat in the back, you've got room for this auxiliary fuel tank. So this allows me to get, uh, you know, another 150 miles of range, which, uh, which works pretty well. And um, less fuel stops, especially when you're going across the, uh, the Arizona, New Mexico's, um, Kansas's of the world. All right, so some of the gear that we'll be taking on the voyage, obviously a helmet. You can see I've got a uh, GoPro housing mounted to the top. That'll give us some uh, time-lapse sort of footage as we're pulling in various locations um, to work out nicely. I've got an aero stitch uh, riding suit that's um, pretty much waterproof. Doesn't have a lot of lining in it. I kind of work that, since I'm in Southern California for most of my riding, and I usually will wear this suit in really any conditions, including 120 degrees in the uh, desert type of thing. I've got a warm, warming layer in the form of a sweatshirt. Uh, moving on, I've got an electric vest, which will go underneath the uh, sweatshirt. This box, which I'm going to mount to the uh, tail area of the motorcycle. And some waterproof Gore-Tex boots. And... Um, some warm and safe uh, electric booties that will basically be plugging into the electric vest um, which will work out nicely as well and then I'll wear a uh, face shield I can go over to the bag here got a warming layer for the legs and face shield basically for the neck area more than anything and keep a little bit of heat on top, nylon, but still fit the helmet and then a warming layer around the neck since we'll be exposed to the wind and some pretty uh, substantial kind of ski gloves um, as uh, a lot of temperatures there are going to be down in the 20s for some of the trip. All right, so real quick, we'll do a uh, try on on some of the gear, uh, show you how it all connects to the bike, and uh, talk a little bit about the trip. 
the first thing we're going to do is uh, go for these electric booties. And uh, a company by the name of Warm and Safe. I'll throw a link down below. Um, you see, oh, I already made a mistake. And the cord is on. You're going to want that on the. No, you're going to want that on the outside of the leg. So it's a long cord that's going to connect each booty. Um, basically, when he gets up to the crotch area. Left booty. And what there is is just a whole bunch of uh, like very flexible heating elements all around in the toe box area and uh, throughout. So that'll be good. Um, and this is the sort of Y connector that we would connect between. plug for each booty and that you know, run that either on the outside or inside of your leg. I'm just going to throw it through a belt loop just so it's not all over the place. And my connections for my uh, electric vest is what this is going to connect to and control both at the same time. So that's on my left side of my body so I'll just lay that over here. Also go through a belt loop. And now we've got booties. Seems uh, it's about 70, 77 degrees right now in November in Southern California. Seems a little odd to be putting all this gear on. But like I said, I'll wear the riding suit in every condition. I think it makes it more reflective. I'm ready in case it rains. And in extreme desert, we'll do a video on extreme desert riding. Um, there's a million different ways to, to, uh, to ride in the desert for like an hour, for like two hours. The kind of riding I'm doing, I could be in the desert for 11 hours, right? So how do you keep the body cool? A riding suit actually helps you with that. You can get the whole thing zipped up, get the right kind of undergarments wet and get that uh, evaporative cooling going on inside the suit uh, and then just keep re-wetting it every couple of hours as needed. Um, all right so I got the waterproof Gore-Tex boots on, booties on underneath and now we'll do the uh, jacket. Really a vest. Full-blown jacket would be a little bit better. for the, uh, that's what I have on this particular motorcycle. Otherwise, it's just a regular coax that could be used, coaxial connector that could be used and um, just depending on what you have wired to your electrical system on the bike. This is the uh, cable from the booties. And this particular vest is a built-in controller. So most heating elements out there you'll find um, the controller will either be a wireless one that can go on the vest or in your pocket, or it's gonna be actually mounted to the bike. So you'll have a thermostat control on the bike. This bike has both. So it has a thermostat or what's called a heat troller, um, pulse width modulation uh, to control the amount of heat, same kind of controller that would you'd use for LED lighting. Um, but I'm gonna use this one that's built into the vest and just hook this electrical connection into the constant um, uh, uh, not regulated, um, regular 14 volt supply on the uh, bike. The other thing it's going to have is this little pigtail, which is going to take the connection from the booties. So it'll control both, um, right here once I'm plugged in. So the next step would be to put the uh, sweatshirt on and that's basically going to be my only warmth for the for the uh, arms it's going to help with the neck because I, I don't want to wear that face mask as much as I need to so during the day I probably won't need it when I'm going across the southern states New Mexico and Arizona I probably won't need it but at nighttime you know 
7,000 feet uh, going up on 40 towards Santa Fe. Um, yeah, that's, that could be temperatures in the 16s and the 20s. Uh, anything below about 40 degrees for more than an hour, I'm going to want the face mask on. Um, but sweatshirt would give me the warming for the arms. I'm going to leave that off because it's so darn warm here. But now I'll uh, don the, this one-piece Aerostitch suit. Aerostitch, um, great company. A little pricey, but uh, really good service out of Duluth, Minnesota. Um, between them and Climb, pretty much the number one motorcycling gear for, for what we're talking about here and doing all-weather riding. Turns out I'm warm, <laughs> but then we'll just want the uh, thermostat control here sticking out the side so I control that while I'm riding. There's a Velcro on the back, allows it to stick to the front of the uh, front of my leg there while I'm going down the highway. Then we'll just need to pull out the power cord. plug into the bike. So here we go. Pick this up. But just want to show you a couple of the features here. So 12.9 um, volts. This power actually works whenever the motorcycle is on. You see the little uh, heat troller knob. It's the same thing as what you see up here. This box is sitting underneath the plastic. Um, so this is used for the, the grips. And this guy is used for the port that's all the way pretty hard to see but that's the normal place we would put heated gear uh, right where the fingertip is so that knob controls that rheostat uh, controls that this is constant power when the bike is on so we're gonna go ahead and plug in check our connections Okay, so let's start, uh, we're going to have to start the bike up, so just bear with me one second. position, the medium position is the, the amber light, and a green for low. So I'm just going to keep it on high and make sure, kind of op checking, that everything works for the trip. Oh, yep, I feel the torso getting really warm. And just make sure I can feel the booties uh, kick in. All right, so that's the uh, the walkthrough on the, the on the motorcycle and cold weather equipment. Um, should be leaving here shortly. Got to finish packing up here and try to make it uh, to the Albuquerque area here in the next eleven hours or so. But ju just a couple closing remarks. Uh, I think the the big thing is there's going to be a spot walla spot walla link uh, down in the description. Um, that's going to show my real-time position. 
So uh, if you want to watch that tracking across as I'm uh, making various uh, video segments that may not get edited until I actually arrive, um, barring any uh, crazy breakdowns or anything like that. So that'll be interesting, and I'll drop little flags when I hit on my uh, satellite tracker. I hit an OK message if I'm uh, taking video footage or getting gas or something like that. I can drop a message so if you see a flag on there. Um, that's what that is for. Um, the only other thing is for the for the motorcycling endurance enthusiasts that are going to come here from those uh, forums and lists that uh, that know me and you want to know uh, some of the rally secrets that I possess. <laughs> um, I will do some future vlogs on some of that. Uh, some of my methodologies and uh, routing, um, decision making and stuff is a little bit old school. I, I actually think um, we could develop some more modern systems now that a lot of mapping and functionality is available via smartphone or um, or uh, tablet and that sort of thing. So um, you can look for that. And for the poker community, thanks for sitting through uh, some of the motorcycle stuff. Um, I'll I'm gonna I guess violate some of the YouTube best practices and have a channel that's devoted to a couple of different things. Um, which, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But uh, in the intro and in the labeling, I'll try to make it uh, obvious that it's primarily either motorcycle content or poker content. And you can make, uh, you can make a decision based on that. So uh, if for, for the motorcycle crowd and others, if you like the content, please let me know. If there's something you want to see, uh, drop it in the comments. Happy to make that content. And uh, hit subscribe if you're interested in either of the topics. And um, appreciate your support. And uh, we'll get some videos out next week with the actual trip.